Great. So welcome to another Go Open National Network webinar. We're so excited today to be talking about connections between OER and digital accessibility and share some work and some common understandings so we can really advance uh, this topic. So we're, we're in conversation with AIM Center CAST and uh, leaders from Oregon that are really deeply involved in this work. Here's a quick overview of the agenda. We'll do a round of introductions. There's uh, two polls that are embedded as we move forward. I'll give a brief intro of the Go Open Network where we are today and uh, hand it to uh, Cynthia Curry to talk about digital accessibility. And then we'll hear from the Oregon Department of Ed team, really excited uh, to hear about uh, the work there and then time for your questions. So why don't we take a moment as we move to introductions to go to the chat and tell us uh, if you like where you're based, your name, your affiliation. Uh, this is uh, Open Ed Week, so we're celebrating uh, a wide audience from maybe around the world. And uh, really happy to see so many names here, new names and names that we recognize. So go right ahead and pop into the chat, say hi. Right, we are from around the world and around the country. Wonderful. So let's uh, introduce our distinguished panel. Why don't you take it, Cynthia, and then uh, I'll round it out. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. I'm Cynthia Curry. I'm uh, Director of Technical Assistance at CAST, and part of my role in um, overseeing our technical assistance at CAST is also being the project director for the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. CAST is, is originally based out of uh, the Boston, Massachusetts area, but we have like so many other organizations are now remote. And I live in Portland, Maine. Thanks so much for being here and the opportunity to share this really good work around digital accessibility and OER. Vanessa. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Hello, my name is Vanessa Clark. I'm a program analyst for digital learning at the Oregon Department of Education. And um, I lead our Oregon Open Learning team, which is um, our Oregon Open Learning Hub on OER Commons. Hello, friends. My name is Ajali Moore. I am the Instructional Materials Coordinator at Oregon Department of Education. I also am one of the state leaders for our Accessible Educational Materials cohort and on the Oregon Open Learning Hub team. So I am very excited to share with you all. Happy Open Education Week. Thanks, Ashley. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Highfield. I am a digital instructional materials coordinator dash curator with Oregon Department of Education. And I am also a part of the Oregon Open Learning team. And I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. I'm Amy Evans Godwin with ISCME, senior advisor. And uh, ISCME, if you don't know, we're a global nonprofit based in Northern California. We do we open education research and services based on our uh, infrastructure, our public digital library and collaboration platform, OER Commons. And uh, we uh, can, uh, facilitate networks like Go Weapon Network and uh, other communities of practice and uh, support uh, national and international uh, changes in policy and practice around open ed. So really excited to be here for open ed week. So let's try a little poll because we never know uh, who knows about, uh, about OER and how deeply that runs in your own setting, in your own practice. So we thought we would maybe just take the temperature uh, of the room here. Let's launch just one question. 
if you're all seeing that, what experience have you had with OER, Open Educational Resources? Okay, looks like you have most of our responses. Can I stop the poll and share results? This is all anonymous. And uh, a lot of experience uh, uh, where you have created, adapted, and shared OER. That's terrific. And access, yes. Browsed. And also those that are new to the space. So welcome, really great to see that it's uh, a broad spectrum. Well, that's unexpected. Okay. <laughs> there we go. The Go Open Network is uh, a community of educators and leaders that support K-12, in particular, open education through knowledge sharing. Uh, we were involved in other strategic actions to support practice and policy to really improve teaching and learning overall through the use of OER. And uh, just to give you a sense of where we are today, uh, Go, the Go Open Network was a federal initiative starting in 20. 15, ISKME joined as a partner with the Office of Education, Educational Technology in 2018. And then it's just been a year that we're celebrating being community led and changing the governance to having uh, a few partners and a steering committee that are building new ways for uh, making it easier to join. And, and now any individual can join, every educator is, uh, uh, allowed to become a member of Go Open simply by going to the hub we, where we share resources on OER Commons. It's easy to find if you look either under all hubs or search for Go Open, you'll be able to find that. And we invite all of you to join the member uh, group and share resources there um, to this space. We are involved in looking for professional learning opportunities and, and offering them. And this webinar series that we've been doing uh, starting in January is an example of building up the professional learning around OER, especially for the K-12 audience. And our digital um, policy actions have been uh, initially launched around connecting OER to digital equity and expanding the definition of digital equity to not only be around um, hardware and connectivity, but also what to do with um, the equipment and, and to the use of quality content that could be equitably accessed and used. So for those of you especially that are new to the OER space, the materials are openly licensed or in the public domain. They're all manner and media of materials meant to be designed with equity in mind to remove the barriers to access and use that might be in place due to financial circumstances, geographic location, your own learning needs, disabilities, or other circumstances to really make it possible for everyone to have access to high quality materials. Other benefits are can be related to practice, that educators become more deeply engaged and invested with curriculum that they can create or adapt themselves. And by doing so, can contextualize and customize materials to students' needs. And when students feel included and see themselves reflected in materials, they're more likely to be engaged in their learning. I'm going to pass it to Cynthia. Great, thanks, Amy. Um, my role in this um, in this webinar is to bring some context to what accessible means, 
Um, as I mentioned at the at the opening in my introduction, I'm project director for the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials for Learning at CAST. CAST is a research and development um, small organization growing rapidly. Uh, CAST is where the Universal Design for Learning uh, framework was developed and continues to be researched uh, and developed over time. And at CAST, we see accessibility as really the, the grounding and the foundation of a universal design for learning uh, experience, uh, including the use of open educational resources. And we'll talk a little bit about that and put it in um, some practical terms when the Oregon team uh, talks about their use of, of OER uh, across their state and how they're interacting with OER accessibility as part of their uh, OER Commons Hub and their OER initiative. But we provide um, at CAST at, at, through the National AIM Center, so Accessible Educational Materials, we just refer to it as AIM, so you can come along with us and just collapse it to, to AIM. And we provide uh, no-cost technical assistance through the Office of Special Education Programs um, at the U.S. Department of Education. So know that the work that we're doing with Oregon um, has been part of our intensive technical assistance program and what we're doing with Oregon and our cohort of six other states really is meant to benefit other states and, and districts. So we'll be pointing to some of the resources on our website that have really been developed out of these partnerships and that we will uh, that we share widely um, through our, what we're calling our universal technical assistance. So as we start out talking about digital accessibility and OER, we always find it really helpful to come to a common understanding and share a definition of what accessible means. So I always like to start out with what does accessible mean to you? There's no wrong answer. We will get into a context in terms of the National AIM Center's accessible um, you know, definition. But for now, if you would just type in the, in the chat field, the first word that comes to mind when you see, hear, or yes, you could even feel the term accessible, and then wait before pressing return. If you've already done it, it's okay. But I'm gonna to count to 10 and I'll say waterfall. And if everyone would then hit return and we'll see what, um, what everyone's first, your first impressions of the term accessible. Okay, waterfall. Okay, so we've got accessible means freely available. Uh, access, I see the word varied and ability, belonging, approachable, fairness, inclusive, uh, works for everyone, welcoming, easy, the accessible curriculum, timely, uh, convenience, the word justice comes through, equity, inclusive, a couple of times, meeting people where they are. So I think we all are really starting you know, from the same, uh, from the, from really the, the same perception of what accessible means. We're gonna get a little bit closer um, because oftentimes we see uh, that there are some, some wide sort of boundaries on what accessible means and not that they're all wrong. Uh, it's just that in the terms, in the terms of the, the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials and the technical assistance we provide, we're being really specific to the context of disability. So Amy, if you'd go on to the next slide, we'll get right to the definition that we use at the AIM Center. Uh, this definition comes from the Office for Civil Rights, and we like it because it compartmentalizes how you can kind of break apart what accessibility means. Uh, a lot of people kind of wonder why we're using a, a definition from the Office for Civil Rights because it can be intimidating. But our experience with the Office for Civil Rights is really that they are strong partners of our Technical Assistance Center, and they're also really strong partners to districts, uh, higher ed institutions. Uh, OCR really is a is a, an arm of technical assistance, and this definition I think is really uh, a demonstration of how uh, the Office for Civil Rights is supporting uh, agencies and institutions with understanding what accessible means. So it's really a functional definition because accessibility is shaped by what any individual needs to do, uh, that individual's interactions with the environment and that individual's personal preferences. So the definition is that accessible is when a person with a disability can acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions and enjoy the same services as a person without a disability. And all of that is on one side of this definition that we've sort of developed into a, a graphic. Because then on the other side of the same information 
same interactions and same services that are provided to an individual with disability are these three really important qualifiers. And that's in an, an equally effective, equally integrated manner and with substantially equivalent ease of use. So oftentimes when we're talking about accessible or fairness uh, that we stop at the same that it's the same information, same interactions and same services, but then we can sometimes forget that if those, if those aren't provided in a way that's equally effective, equally integrated and with substantially equivalent ease of use, that individual is not going to have the same experience. And we see this all the time with materials and technologies that are used in education when a student with a disability who uses assistive technology might have to wait to use that material, or they might have to wait till something's troubleshoot is some troubleshooting can happen uh, with their assistive technology before they can get through a learning management system or a material needs to be converted to another format like braille or digital text or audio for them. So even if it's not at the same time, that means that even if it's the same material, if it doesn't reach them at the same time that other students are using those materials, we really haven't reached the bar for, for accessible. Next slide, Amy. We have a demonstration. Um, here and actually, I think Amy, you've got a quick poll, right? We do. We move on. Yes, thank you for that uh, definition, Cynthia, and getting us on the same page. We have one more opportunity to see where we're at uh, around accessibility and what our any of our experiences are with it. What experience do you have in addressing accessibility in instructional materials, given? the definition that Cynthia outlined for us. Well, this is great, Amy. It's looking like we have an audience that has a, has really relative to a lot of audiences that um, we do with digital accessibility. There's a lot of experience here. So I hope everyone's really active. Um, I'll let you share the results, but I just want to say sure. how uh, impressed I am with um, the audience and I hope everyone contributes throughout the session. I agree. I agree. If you're, if you're not familiar or haven't interacted or made accessible materials, uh, there's nothing to be ashamed of, but it's a very impressive group of, of experienced folks that have been doing this work. Thank you. We'll stop sharing that. And uh, all of this will be made uh, available afterwards, the recording and uh, all our resources. So let me close that and go on to your compelling example here, Cynthia. I'll play that. So here's a, um, an, an, a video of a student who I worked with 15 years ago. Uh, I really like this example because it shows, it shows digital accessibility 15 years ago in a way that we should really be seeing more frequently even today. So in, this was a 2008, uh, Tyler is blind. He's an eighth grader in 2008. And I was uh, at the time a statewide integration technology mentor for the state of Maine. And there were, uh, Maine was the first one-to-one -one program in the country. There were the, the Apple iBooks were deployed across the state to all seventh and eighth graders in 2003, 2004. So this was uh, you know, circa uh, 2008. And when those laptops were deployed across the state, our educational services for blind and visually impaired children you know, raised some concerns because although it was this great undertaking that we were building some equity and some fairness uh, and distributing these devices across all seventh and eighth graders across the state, what was missing was access for braille readers and screen reader users, so our blind students. And Apple responded by developing VoiceOver. And VoiceOver is the screen reader that is built now across all Apple devices, Mac OS and iOS. But Tyler was one, he was a pioneer. He was one of the first users uh, of VoiceOver, eighth grader. And in 2008, 
Cable Elizabeth Middle School here in Maine had purchased a digital science curriculum. Curriculum. And that digital science curriculum is accessible in 2008 with, with Tyler's uh, science book. So I just wanted to show this particular example of how accessibility works. And while you're watching this video, you'll be thinking about all of the components that need to come together to have this accessible experience for Tyler. Thinking about there's the, there's the book that's accessible. It's a Prentice Hall book. Uh, there is the technology that's delivering that accessible book, which would be the the iBook, the, the laptop, as well, as well as the platform that Prentice Hall built. And then there is the, the assistive technology. There's Tyler Screen Reader, who is accessing this content. So he's going to walk through um, how he, again, this is 2008, is using voiceover through keyboard commands to open his science book. Same science book as all eighth graders at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. HTML content. Okay, so that sound indicates that the page is loaded. So I just select a textbook. And to do that, I go to control option down and I go to view. And that'll just bring me up a list of links. Nothing else, just links. Link chooser menu, 24 items. 24 items meaning links. So I'll press the letters for the links and that'll get all down. So the book is called Science Explored. So I'll press SC together. Like this. One item, Science Explorer 2009 Astronomy. Science Explorer 2009 Astronomy. I'll press Control Option Space to get out of the menu. So now I'm on back to the normal web page. I'll press it and it'll open up the text. It'll click the link and open up the textbook. Press HTML content, HTML content, HTML content, Safari, as new window. The textbook. I love the way Tyler concludes that with. And here's the textbook. So that's a perfect simulation where he doesn't need an accommodation. Everything is built in right there for him. And that's really what we're talking about with accessibility. You know, there's the, if we have the material, the technology, and the assistive technology all working together. So on the next slide, kind of pull this all apart. Um, so you can see how we have this you know, dual accessibility between the material and the technology. So in your when you're in conversations within your states and your districts, and again, you're thinking about, are we achieving accessibility? It's not just the purchasing of the material and making sure that it's accessible, or I'm sorry, we're, we're, we're choosing curating the, the OER, but it's also making sure that the technology is going to be, um, is going to also work to make sure that that accessibility holds across, across platforms, uh, devices, uh, applications. So the material will be your information or the content of the curriculum. So when we're talking about OER, we're talking about the the text that is delivered through the through the through the format, whether that OER is delivered through HTML or PDF or EPUB or Word doc, or perhaps it's a video or it could be audio. Really, any material is the is the content of the curriculum. It's the information that we're providing to students to advance their their learning and their understanding. And then the technology is what delivers that material to the students. So that would be the video player, for example. So YouTube, the player itself would be the technology. Uh, it could be the learning management system through which the students access that content. Uh, it could be the tablet, could be any hardware or software that delivers that information. And then it's accessible if assistive technology works with that material and technology or is usable with it. So in the case of Tyler on the next slide, I kind of broke this down for you where the, the material is the science book, the 2009, the 2009 science book, the digital book, and the technology is the iBook that was deployed to all students, including Tyler, it had built in voiceover. Uh, and then the eBook platform that Prentice Hall built to deliver that book was also compatible with Tyler's screen reader, which is voiceover, which serves as his assistive technology. So although you know, it, it, this may, hopefully it, hopefully it creates some logic around what we're talking about accessibility, but it's not just assistive technology, it's not, it's not special education technology, we're really talking about building accessibility into the curriculum in a way that is equally effective equally integrated and of substantial equivalent ease of use uh, for students with disabilities. 
So framework that we, another framework that we used um, at the AIM Center, this is our, it's not our core model, but we have sort of adapted it in a way that breaks it down into questions, um, into skills and practices. But POR is based on the web content accessibility guidelines, which are the established uh, accessibility standards. And POR stands for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And our designers at CAS uh, built a, some graphics around the POR model to show that there are multiple ways that students interact across devices, as well as with the materials themselves. So we can think about print materials as being accessible as, as well. Sometimes we think about OER as being digital, but oftentimes those can be printed out and they can be provided in different formats. It can be tactile, it can be embossed braille uh, for students. So making OER very adaptable. So perceivable is when we create or curate OER that everyone uh, can sense, whether they can see it, hear it, feel it through braille or tactile graphics. Operable means that everyone can navigate the content and interact with it with, with ease. Understandable means that the content is presented in a way that's intuitive and predictable. And robust means that it's accessible and compatible with assistive technology across devices. So the student may use a Chromebook in school, they may go home and use a tablet, but that accessibility is holds regardless of the technology and is always working with their AT. And then finally, wanted to bring up a universal design for learning, which is sort of an extension of the concepts of accessible, but I know this is important to our Oregon team and they're gonna talk about it uh, in the context of accessibility. But if you're not familiar with, with UDL, this is a, a framework that CAS developed in the 80s and continues to develop over time and, and conducts a lot of research and, and professional development. It's based on three principles uh, that there should be multiple representations of engagement, representation, and action and expression in order to respond to learner variability. So when we're talking about accessibility, a lot of it is embedded in that provide multiple means of representation um, principle in that when we're thinking about the materials of a curriculum, including assessment, to be thinking about all the different ways that that material can be provided and make sure that's malleable and flexible. And when materials are available through open educational resources, that allows these adaptations to happen because we're not held down to the copyright restrictions and somebody like Tyler, in order to get access to something to be modified, would have to go through a series of sort of copyright exemptions. When something's open, it just lends itself to much more efficiently and rapidly being provided to students uh, through multiple means of representation. And I get to pass it over to the Oregon team now. Thank you. This might still be yours, Cynthia. No? Oh, oh it is still mine. Oh, I forgot. I oh, yes, it's still mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you could do this though, Arjali. These are our protocols. So these are um, the AIM Center's uh, protocols for creating accessible OER and for curating um, accessible OER. So I put the bit.ly's to both of these um, resources. When the uh, Oregon team talks about the Accessible OER Academy that the AIM Center offered in partnership with ISMI last fall, uh, these were the protocols that we used that served as the, you know, the foundational resources for that academy. Protocol for creating accessible OER walks through some very um, practical skill sets. So if you're creating a document, if you're creating a video, uh, if you're creating podcasts, creating accessible OER uh, provides some, some of those, those skill sets and practical applications. And then curating accessible OER helps walk through uh, OER curators and what to look for. So that's really based on our poor uh, our poor model of what's perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Thanks, Ashley. Thank we are sharing the PowerPoint and the recording. We got a question about that. So you'll be able to get the links from the slides as well. I'll just share a message uh, comment from the chat uh, from a, a little bit before from Christopher Dobson. We still have a way to go on the development of truly accessible interactions, I think, need to advocate and push for more development in accessible interactions for OER content, such as can be developed in H5P. A lot of this work does uh, relate to that, so thank you. All right, and our next slide for Ashley. 
There you go. Thank you, Amy. And thanks, Cynthia, for the great setup. And the beautiful and smiling faces that you see on the screen are most of the members of our Oregon AIM cohort. And as Cynthia mentioned, we're partnering with the National Center on Accessibility educational materials for learning and six other states to receive intense technical assistance over four years. And this means coaching and resources on implementing multiple and varied evidence-based practices, such as how to make sure that accessibility is part of the state and local procurement process, how to create accessible materials for each content area, develop guidelines for all stakeholders, collect and use data to continuously improve student learning experiences, and allocate resources effectively. So a lot of work that they're helping us with in the intensive technical assistance program. And this photograph was taken during our retreat in August where we had spent a tireless two days collaborating on a statewide vision for building robust coordinated systems for providing accessible materials and technologies in a timely manner for all learners who need them. Our cohort includes individuals from early childhood education, K-12 education, general education and special education, technology departments, our state education agency, and more because we're a diverse and amazing group of individuals. Our partner districts include Baker School District, Hood River School District, and Tiger Tualatin School District. This is a group of amazing educators who have deep expertise in accessibility, special education, technology, higher education, and more. However, the folks in our Oregon AIM cohort in all of their brilliance needed to build a little bit of muscle around OER and open licensing. If you want to go to the next slide, Amy, that's when we're going to get into our accessible educational materials group. And this is where the magic of having everyone at the table really happens. As members of the Oregon Open Learning team, we recognize that there is a need for resource, resource sharing as a strategy for the Oregon AIM cohort's statewide plan for acquiring AIM. Luckily, we had just the place to do that in the Oregon Open Learning Hub. We started by offering professional learning synchronously and asynchronously to build the confidence of cohort members that needed to um, build up their muscle before they started using OER Commons. And from there, the Oregon Open Learning team collaborated with the AIM cohort on the Accessible Educational Materials group on the Oregon Open Learning Hub. And the group is used as a collaborative space where resources that our Oregon AIM cohort creates and curates can be found and shared. Currently, the group has over 140 resources related to accessible educational materials. Many of these resources are policy documents, guidance documents, templates, and professional learning resources. Since it is so easy to search by accessibility feature on OER Commons, the Oregon AIM cohort decided to approach this group as a place for everything except instructional resources. So while there may not be a lot of lesson plans in this group, it is full of resources that are valuable to educators and administrators who are making sure that all of their students have timely access to educational materials. Additionally, one of the best things about this group is that all of the resources are openly licensed and the group is open to other members who are not in our cohort. So educators who are not members of the Oregon cohort, including cohort members from other states, have access to this group, allowing them to use, adapt, and share the resources. Additionally, if they have a resource that they are willing to share, they can even upload it into our Oregon AIM group on the Oregon Open Learning Hub. And as our official cohort work with CAST ends next year, this artifact will live on and hopefully provide immense benefits to Oregon educators, educators around the nation, and students who require AIM. Oh, um, I think I put some transit transitions in there. You can click through those so all of the images are seen. There you go. All right. Sorry about that. Um, 
the ISKME, I, I'm going to talk about the ISKME and AIM Accessibility Academy that we all went through last fall. ISKME and AIM Academy was truly a wonderful learning experience as it helped me personally to identify blind spots in my own learning. It also gave participants a chance to address those blind spots. First off, the Academy helped me redefine my thinking on what is meant by accessibility. Especially during the pandemic, many educators equated accessibility with connectivity and would assume, as did I, that materials were accessible if a student could simply log on and be connected to the internet and go to a website and see materials. Of course, this isn't the case as accessibility includes many more issues like screen readers, closed captioning, color contrast, reading levels, text to speech, and so on. Academy also helped me to reframe the purpose of digital instructional materials. Traditionally, many educators like myself go straight to content and use that as a central factor in a curriculum adoption process. Does the content meet the state standards? Is it both accurate and engaging? However, my learning about accessibility made me reframe my thinking about digital instructional materials, because even if the content is strong, if, it is, if not all of my students can access it, then is it really strong content? And this brings me to the idea of being intentional about accessibility at the beginning of a materials adoption or creating materials for you know, um, open educational resources. Um, instead of addressing accessibility at the end of the process. Luis, one of our fabulous instructors, likened this to baking a blueberry muffin with accessibility being the blueberries. If you stir the blueberries into the batter before baking, then you will end up with some delicious blueberry muffins. However, if you bake the muffins without the blueberries and then try to pour the blueberries on top of the already cooked muffins, you just won't have the same results. And this is what we see in many digital instructional materials today. When accessibility is only considered at the very end, then materials have to be retrofitted. And this is not always easy or even possible. And lastly, the Academy helped me practice with tools that I could use myself to do some initial evaluation of materials. There are, are many pieces of digital curriculum or many digital curriculum providers who say in good faith that their materials are accessible, but they might have some blind spots or perhaps they have a different definition of what accessibility is. Trusting that people are acting in good faith is generally a good thing to do, I personally believe that, but verifying accessibility features is important as we need to ensure that all of our students have access to quality materials. And I really appreciated the chance to learn more and to, and to grow. And as, as Chris Dobson mentioned earlier, we have some work to do. And part of it, part of that work is just educating others about uh, what accessible, accessibility means and how that is applied to digital instructional materials. Thanks, Matt. We had a great time at the um, ISKME and AIM Academy. That was a fantastic learning experience for us. And I think being able to participate in that really demonstrated how dedicated our team at the Department of Education is um, in, in making sure accessibility is incorporated into all of our initiatives. And we'll highlight one of those initiatives with our Oregon Instructional Materials Evaluation and Adoption Process. In Oregon, our state education agency evaluates and adopts instructional materials on a seven-year content area-based cycle. Instructional materials are defined in Oregon policy as any organized system which constitutes the major instructional vehicle for a given course of study or any part thereof. A major instructional vehicle may include such instructional materials as hardbound or softbound books, sets or kits of materials, including electronic, internet, and web-based materials and media. In Oregon, we include open educational resources that meet the definition of instructional material to be included in the evaluation and adoption of instructional materials. 
We even have a fee waiver option in Oregon for open educational resources that permit the free use and repurposing by others. So if it's an openly licensed item, it's an OER and it's being um, proposed by the organization to be used in its free use format, that's something that qualifies for a fee waiver in Oregon. Accessible educational materials are required to be provided to students under Oregon law and federal law. Oregon Department of Education ensures that the requirements are met by including all parties and involving, uh, making sure that all of those parties are involved in the accessibility of adopted materials. So districts must provide students with free appropriate instructional and resource materials in a timely manner and often the language included in their local contracts during procurement require that. Publishers are required to prepare and provide to the National Materials, Instructional Materials Access Center or NIMAC, electronic files containing the contents of their instructional materials using the National Instructional Materials Accessibility Standard, also known as NIMAS. This is required to be completed by the start of the contract period, Additionally, ODE enters into written contracts with each publisher, requiring that adopted materials meet all accessibility standards and are provided in an alternative format for students who require adaptations. ODE maintains a strong commitment to accessibility, but as you heard in our definition, not all OER fit into the basal instructional materials evaluation and adoption process in our state. For this reason, we have also created an OER quality framework for materials added to the Oregon Open Learning Hub. And Vanessa is going to share more about that next. Yeah, so, um, so when we started building an OER hub for Oregon, one of our goals was that we wanted, um, first, we wanted educators to be able to find high quality resources. We also wanted to make sure that they were aligned to Oregon standards. Um, as Ajali was just describing, Oregon already has a really rigorous evaluation and adoption process for instructional materials that cover a full grade level or a full course of content. So we wanted the evaluation of OER materials that cover smaller chunks of content, say something like a lesson plan or a unit, to be as aligned as possible to the instructional materials evaluations. So our team worked with other specialists across our Department of Education and with input from external partners to develop the Oregon OER Quality Framework. The Oregon OER Quality Framework can be used to guide the development of resources or to evaluate fully developed resources. We use the framework to set a standard of quality that resources must be passed before they're added into the collections in our Oregon Collections section. So far, we have, um, we've used the framework for two projects, our um, Multilingual English Learner Resource Bank and our Sex Ed Open Learning Grant. And so those are both now collections available on the hub and all of the resources there have um, been evaluated with our Oregon OER Quality Framework. Embedded in the framework, we have accessibility as a foundational indicator, meaning that all of the resources must meet this indicator. The framework requires that resources are designed to support students across a brain, broad range of skills and abilities, um, and that they're based on the poor principles and universal design for learning, which Cynthia talked about earlier. Um, before we publish the resources to the Oregon Collections, we also do an additional check that the resources meet web content accessibility guidelines. Um, so we, we go through all of that to make sure that what we're putting into those collections is not only high quality in terms of meeting the standards, but also high quality in terms of making sure that all students have access to those materials. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so OER is just one initiative at ODE that we are focusing on accessibility. Um, there are lots of other initiatives, though, that incorporate accessibility. Um, basically, about five years ago, the department underwent a full overhaul of our website to ensure that both the platform that our website is on 
and everything that we post is compliant with web accessibility guidelines, and we now have a web content council carrying this work forward. We also have standard language that's included in all of our procurement contracts that requires that products developed for us meet accessibility guidelines. So when we contract out work for the development of professional learning or other types of content, um, if we require both open licensing and accessibility in the terms of those agreements, uh, then the end product that we get is highly usable, adaptable, and accessible to all of the school districts in our state. Additionally, when we post this content on our Oregon Open Learning Hub, it's easily shareable with others across the nation and globally. And then last but not least, um, we also have accessibility written into the position descriptions for our staff. So everyone is responsible for producing documents that are accessible. And like Ajali mentioned earlier, it's important to have everyone around the table to ensure that accessibility is fully integrated in the work that we do. Oh, I think you're muted, Amy. Sorry, there's one question I'm seeing, uh, Vanessa, maybe for your team about, uh, do you use any specific tools to ensure adherence of resources to accessibility standards? I can hop in on this one. Um, so our agency, as uh, Vanessa had um, indicated in the last slide, we're all trained on our own, on accessibility. So in our contracts and in our initial training with the agency, we're required to go through. Um, we learn how to look for accessibility and how to do accessibility remediations, as well as how to build content accessible accessibly. So that's something that our agency invests professional development within um, our staff members. Additionally, in terms of our OER work, ISCME has a really good accessibility checker within its open author tool, and that is the tool that we used when we are doing our OER development grant work. Um, so using that ISCME accessibility checker, and I know they've done a lot of work with um, the, the AIM Center and national organizations around accessibility on that, that has helped us in our specific OER work that we do within OER Commons. Um, additionally, another tool that we, we use is the Adobe Pro Accessibility Checker for PDFs, um, and there are often other accessibility checkers that are embedded into each software that you're using to create content, so I would encourage you, whether it be Word, Google Docs, um, PDF that you're using to explore what the best um, accessibility scanner within that program is because that will help you um, find the best guidance online to make sure that you are following all of those accessibility um, guidelines. And then lastly, this was one thing that we may have uh, neglected to mention, Luis gave, and the AIM Center gave us a bunch of tools that we're able to use depending on what the accessibility error is as well. So there's a little bit of nuance to the accessibility work. Um, building, I believe, building accessibility content is easier so that you don't have to do some of that really specific nuanced work where you're searching for errors and trying to remediate them. Um, but there are plenty of uh, software systems and tools that you can use out there, depending on what file format you're looking at. Great. Thank you, Ashley. And if people are looking in the chat, there's other suggestions and links. So thank you so much. Uh, from the Oregon team and, and those of you adding to the chat there. There's so much information that we're learning uh, about Oregon's process being rigorous and coordinated and integrated with OER and accessibility. Not all of you are going to have this um, amazing environment already established and you may be coming to accessibility and OER uh, as more uh, of a newbie or leading it in your state. So we thought we'd just put uh, a couple of summary points here is uh, something that you might wanna highlight, Cynthia. Uh, I, I wanna highlight uh, again that OER is really uh, a suitable solution element. It's not um, open as the endpoint in itself, but really uh, open resources as 
the opportunity it affords to give everyone the chance to have access and use of high quality educational materials that can be designed from the beginning or adapted to be contextualized and fit to the classroom and really remove barriers uh, that, that you've heard about um, by using UDL guidelines and accessibility standards to right from the beginning. Anything you'd like to add there, Cynthia or Oregon, before we go to questions? Yeah, I would just I would just stress that. Um, and I think the Oregon team agrees too. When you're learning about accessible educational materials, there's these sort of two tracks when it comes to uh, materials that are provided to, to students. When they're under open license, it's just so much more flexible. Uh, you can minimize the need for accommodations because we learn through universal design for learning and multiple representations of information that when the control for flexibility and adaptation is, you know, is held by the creator of that content or by the curator of that content that is trying to make it you know, contextualized and to make it have meaning to, to students and also making it accessible, you can bypass a lot of the logistics of purchasing something and then having to go through the process of, well, does the student qualify under copyright exemption to have a different format and then going through multiple means to try to uh, acquire those formats uh, from accessible media producers that, that hold the keys to providing those materials in other formats for students who qualify for it. So OER uh, really is, a, is part of the solution around digital accessibility, um, as well as obviously a lot of the other benefits um, that come with, with, uh, with open licenses. Great points, thank you. If, if any of you out there have uh, attempted to remediate materials, it is quite complex. So we have a couple of minutes for questions. If you'd like to put it in chat or unmute, don't be shy, just jump right in. I had a question come in through a direct message. Um, so I'll go ahead and verbalize that. And I think Vanessa um, likely will have the best answer from our team. Um, but the question was, did you receive any pushback from faculty or educators to create OER content? Who has ownership over the work? Is it the institution or the instructor? Yeah, that is a really good question. And um, so I'll, I'll break that apart into a couple of pieces. Um, our team really mostly works with K-12 educators, um, but we do have a branch in Oregon called Open Oregon um, that does work with higher education around developing OER materials as well. Um, and I think really for both of our programs, both for, for K-12 and higher education, the important thing has been um, valuing educators' time, and honestly, that means paying them. So when we do, um, when we have funding to do projects, so the the two that I spoke about, the Multilingual English Learner Resource Bank, and the Sex Ed Open Learning Grant, those were both funded projects. We recruited educators to do that work, and we paid them for their time to do that work. Um, and a, as a requirement to um, participate in those projects, they had to be openly licensed. And so um, they, were, they were being compensated. So I, I think that removes some of that um, pushback that we would have gotten if we, if we were not valuing their time in that way. And similarly, I know that um, Open Oregon also has funding to do projects. And um, I don't know exactly what their structures are, but I, I know it's also important to them to value the time of the educators they work with. I'll just put up our last slide. Uh, you continue to um, ask questions if they're out there, but you can reach us and you can get to the Go Open Network either on the Hub and LinkedIn, on Twitter, or our newsletter. We'd love to hear from you and have your engagement. There's just a lot of work to do here. It's really exciting to have so much interest in accessibility and uh, doing a digital accessibility, whether your state, region, or country has implemented such a coordinated effort uh, like Oregon, or you know, you're just starting out. We'd just really love to hear from you. Any more questions out there?
thank you all for coming and for the links. We'll be sharing out the resources. And I hope you're enjoying Open Ed Week uh, as it's wrapping up. But it's just been such a great opportunity to spotlight this work. So thank you. Thank you to my panel. Thank you for the opportunity. It was lots of fun and always great to see you all. Yeah, thanks so much to my ODE friends. This was um, when Amy approached the AIM Center about this. I said we have to, we we have to bring in the the Oregon team because nobody nobody speaks better to this than the actual practitioners and those who are doing the work. So thank you so much for taking you know, additional time um, to to share the good work with with others around the country and um, you know for for being a model of digital accessibility with OER and sharing so many of the resources as well as the process that you've been going through. I mean, you can kind of see these materials, you can see the resources online uh, or through other means, but there's nothing like hearing about the process that's taking place and to be able to build community around it. So thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks, thanks Amy, for the invitation. Right. Yeah, yeah. We, we were super excited, so thank you. Love it. I'll stop the recording now, it's great. <laughs>